Uh, the thing with what we're asking you to do as a jury is unusual, different from most uh, defenses that the defense attorney wants to make or asked to make or usually makes. Because one of the first things that we told you, Ms. Iron told you, is this isn't a whodunit and it's not. And I think as humans, as uh, you might have to speak up a little bit. Humans, as jurors, but anyone, that it can be a difficult thing to accept that anyone can kill someone without defending themselves, without it being at war, without it being accidental and have it not be murder. But it can be. And it's been that way forever in this country. Manslaughter, just the word itself, at least in my mind, sounds even worse than murder. You think of slaughter, you might even describe certain murders as a slaughter. Because of, as Mr. Prosser, in fact, mentioned, the blood. There's blood all over that that truck, the car, Miss Bo. And there were multiple cuts. There was the fatal stab wound. There were the incise or the, the cutting wounds to the hands. There were the marks on the face. But you heard from a medical examiner, her own words, their witness, not ours, that all that, the injuries to the hands and the wound to the chest could have been from the same thrust. Now, Attorneys often like to have their cake in you too, you know, defense attorneys and prosecutors. And so, this were a case where Tracy Mondebaugh had been slashed to pieces, multiple stab wounds, cuts all over her face, deep cuts to her torso, multiple stab wounds, sharp force injuries, her chest, her head, her scalp, her arms, her hands, dozens, dozens and dozens, they would have stood here and told you that is evidence of actual hatred. That is evidence of malice. They don't have that in this case, though, although they're trying, even though their own medical witness said it could have been caused from one thrust. They're trying to say, oh, might have been more than that. Well, okay, even if it was like two or three, which is not what Ms. Boat remembers, that's not evidence of hatred. Because if this were a case with different facts, the state would be arguing the multiple injuries caused from def definitively multiple stab wounds. Where their medical examiner gets up and says, this was a strike, this was a strike, this was a strike, this was a strike. They would argue that's your evidence for malice and hatred. Now, the word malice, no one uses that word anymore. There's all these old timey words we use in the law. You know, that the last time we would have a casual conversation with someone and, you know, Oh, her mother-in-law said she didn't like her choice of paint in the living room. You should have seen the malice in her eyes. No one uses that word anymore. It's an old-fashioned word that has a legal meaning and has forever, as far as the, the legal community, you know, not even in America, in England, the common law. I don't know exactly how far back it goes as a legal definition, but 
It's been around for a long time. Society moves on. We stop using words like that. You know, it'd be perhaps back in the day, the defense during my position would have stood up and said to you know Mr. Prosser, everything he said is balderdash. You know, that's another old tiny word no one uses. But had a specific meaning to them. I don't even know what that means. I'm sure it has some definition, some derivation of the word that we don't even remember anymore. And so, what I'm talking about, there's been this idea of manslaughter in the law for a long time. Back in the pre-Declaration of Independence days, there was an attorney named John Adams. And you might remember from history class in, in elementary school or civics class about what was called the Boston Massacre, when some colonists tossed objects, snowballs, um, nothing really, really dangerous at a group of British soldiers. And they opened fire on the colonists and killed several of them. Now John Adams was an undeniable patriot, not loyal to the crown. In fact, became second president of the US. And as a defense attorney, he said, I'll take that case. I'll represent the British soldiers that shot those colonists. He was probably the most hated man in America. Standing up there, probably in front of a jury of loyal patriots who hated the British, and telling them this wasn't murder. This was manslaughter. And he did that. Now, this isn't a case strange to a lot of attorneys. We sometimes it gets talked about in Fort Dyer or maybe opening, but in Fort Dyer to discuss why defense attorneys do what they do. And and that's not specifically why I bring it up. It's this concept of manslaughter has been in our legal system even before we were an official country. It's been in the common law. It's in Iowa law. And the fact that personal feelings, and there's an instruction, you know, your personal feelings, biases, attitudes, that you have to set those aside. And if personally you have those feelings, I don't know, I can't say that someone you know, should receive mercy or sympathy as described by the state because they couldn't control themselves. They lost their temper. They were provoked. You know, you killed someone, you admitted kill, you killed someone, and you didn't tell me it was self-defense or that you're crazy or that um, it was an accident, so it's murder. No. Your oath is to uphold the law. To apply the law judge, the judge gives you to the facts. And keep your oath. Now the story of this case has been precipitated by someone who didn't keep their oath. Nick Boat. Which is something... consider with, and I want to clarify, there's also been this word, you know, separation that's been used. They were separated. Much like malice, that's a legal term. The state hasn't presented you any document showing there was a legal separation or not. There wasn't. When we say separation, it's what was described by Michelle. And talked about further on cross with Mr. Bull. He, she knew, he told her, 
One evening, there was another woman. They needed to talk. There's another woman. Okay. Next day, he's gone. He said she's at work, and he never comes back. At least, not uh, as a man viewing himself as her husband anymore. That was the separation. That's how they became separated. It wasn't some mutual thing they agreed and, all right, here's how we're planning to divide our assets when we eventually get divorced and, oh, uh, here's my, you know, divorce attorney's business card. And it, it was sudden, unexpected, and devastating to Michelle. And Whatever adjectives the state wants to use for their theme, seething, obsessed, um, whatever adjective, it doesn't matter. Because, of course, how are you going to feel when you've been with someone for that long a period of time, and the circumstances you're in, and you feel abandoned? Now. I want to go back to what I mentioned before. I kind of like to start going into some more specifics from what the state addressed, uh, things I noted from there. Closing. Now, one thing the state, uh, Mr. Prosser, brought up was about the gloves. Well, when she put them on, when she put on the gloves and she opened the trunk, which, you know, when did she put those gloves on? Well, guess what? She testified. They didn't ask her. If they wanted to know that, they could have asked her, and they didn't. She testified in front of you. If the state wanted to know that, you'd have an answer. They didn't ask it. Now, said so this is not a self-defense case. There were, Mr. Prosser mentioned that, there's no evidence of self-defense that Tracy was attacked and was defending herself. If you're being attacked by a manslaughter, like Michelle, yes, you can defend yourself. And you know what? If Tracy had ended up pulling her own knife out of the truck and stabbed and killed Michelle, it probably would have been justified. That's not what this case is about. That's why it's manslaughter. It's not about whether Tracy was allowed to defend herself and that she's in a seatbelt and that she's in a closed-in space and that, uh, oh, the downward angle thing that the medical examiner could have testified to them, by the way, about the, the degree of the angle you know, of the wound. It, that's something they do. Like, oftentimes, you might hear that, but no angle of downward, no downward angle was given. Just it was downward and from, I don't recall, left to right, right to left, but that just means where the hand position is, the angle of the knife compared to where it enters the human body. Now, the discussion of the blood how much blood there was, and, and Mr. Prosser mentioned this, this phrase called cast off. It's another legal phrase that blood spatter experts use. State didn't call a blood spatter expert. They had one at DCI named Mike Halverson. He didn't testify for you. But uh, that's Mike Halverson. What is cast off? Is that when you come from a knife? I'm sorry, I'm a little <laughs> Does cast off only come from a knife or a weapon? I could say no. If you have a hand with those kind of wounds, gushing blood, and you're fighting with Michelle, who's just stabbed you, wounds are going to leave blood spatter and cast off. Not just a knife with blood on it. 
I mean, trying to make Michelle into Norman Bates, you know, in the shower, is wailing away. Well, the physical evidence isn't there. It's cast off from any number of things. It could be an object, it could be a hand. Probably some of it was from the knife. Could have been. But again, the state's own forensic evidence doesn't support this being beyond one thrust that caused that stab wound. Marks to the head could have been from nails, even the ones that look like pressure or something. And you can look at the photo yourself, but there's some of the ones that are wider and don't appear to actually be cuts, but like small pressure um, defects in the skin. I mean, if it was gloved fingers, possibly it could cause those types of marks. Because I mean, if it was a knife, I mean, what, what's happening? Is she just like holding the knife out like this in front of her face, moving it back and forth? I, that doesn't make sense. There's a struggle going on. The hair that's in various things. Michelle, what she left behind, her DNA at the scene suggests a struggle of some type. When we say struggle, I'm not placing any blame on Tracy for this. Because like I said, Michelle ended up the one dead. Tracy have a good defense if they ever even charged her in the first place. So the issue is what was going on in Michelle's mind. We said this isn't a mental health defense, and it's not. But it requires you, specific intent requires you, um, things that say knowledge require you to uh, kind of divine the intent of an individual and what's in their mind. And manslaughter has that. Now, as a jury, I'd like to Three jobs during your deliberations. Make decisions about the case. The evidence has been shown. You are charged with the task of interpreting that evidence, applying the law the judge has given you, and deciding what all of you can agree on that you believe happened, didn't happen, was thought, was not thought, you know, in the mind. This, this divining the intent or the knowledge of the individual, of Michelle. Another job is to make sure your fellow jurors follow the law the judge gives you. In your deliberations, if you feel there's an instruction or law that isn't being observed or is being ignored or too much weight putting, uh, put on one thing, or if someone discusses something that wasn't in evidence that they may have heard about, and we covered the, this in Vordire, but you, know, you never know. Since the trial has started, if anyone has heard anything, um, trying to consider evidence that's outside what has been presented in this courtroom. I'd ask you if that's happening, that you let the judge know, the court attendant know, if it gets beyond just a short discussion saying, look, we can't know, and move on. They're persistent. Let the court know. Now, deliberation requires you to not only have your own opinion, 
but to listen to the opinion of others. That doesn't mean you have to accept it. It doesn't mean you have to uh, change your opinion, but to deliberate. Now, that's a word that's used elsewhere here, to deliberate. And if you think about what's being asked to you to deliberate on a murder case, or the state is asking you to decide whether someone committed murder or not, and then you see that same word, deliberate, uses apply to what Michelle didn't have the chance to do for, say, manslaughter or for murder or premeditation. If Michelle had time to deliberate, that can have impact on the charges that you believe the state uh, charge or charges the state may have been able to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt. And what we're arguing is that that's manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter. And the use of that word, it's not just superfluous or um, flowery language. It's, it has impact because all you do as jurors is deliberation. Now, in addition, there's a question that all of you jurors have to ask yourselves about what has happened, what has been done, and I believe that's best summed up in, did the prosecution logically rule out all the reasonable doubts which are possibilities based upon reason? Now, I know Mr. Prosser put up that you don't have to look for doubts. You have to look for the truth. The truth is already there at the start. And that's it. Shell both is presumed innocent. That's the truth. You have to get past the doubt of the state's allegation itself. That is a doubt until they prove it. So you start off the case looking for doubt because Ms. Boat, like all criminal defendants in every case ever in the United States, are presumed innocent. So you do have to look for doubt. This isn't just something you ignore. They either did or didn't rule them out. And that's your only decision. Now, they didn't bring this up in the closing argument. I know the state and they always get rebuttal. We never get rebuttal. They get the last word uh, because they have the burden. So I assume, possibly, there's going to be a return to this theme because Mr. Bull brought it up in opening, that Michelle was hunting. She was a hunter, hunting down Tracy. A hunter, the only hunter, Elmer Fudd. He wasn't very, ever very successful because Describing Michelle as a hunter is ridiculous. There's months that go by. I mean, what, what is the hunt? What, what is the, the pointless wandering around, checking things out? In all of this, all of this, quote, hunting behavior occurred before March 22nd, when she dealt with, uh, or went to mental health treatment and was discharged. Now, I know the state described the first Vermeer encounter um, 
is in April, but I don't recall that from the evidence. I don't think they ever established exactly when it was. Michelle, we've said before March 22nd, when she went to treatment. I don't think there's any testimony given about the exact date uh, on that. But this hunting wasn't very premeditated, planned, um, thought out. And look at the evidence left behind. She's been planning this for months. What she's going to do to Tracy, you don't even do a walk around to your car when you get back and be like, all right, do I need to come out here with, you know, towels and be ready, have it ready to clean up, get that bracelet off of the car, throw it away, burn it, do something. The toilet tank. I mean, you throw the stuff in the toilet tank and hop in the shower. I mean, this, this is something nearby with a lid where you toss something, hoping it stays hidden while you get in the shower to wash yourself off, eat, you know, you to hide evidence or, you know, because you're disgusted with what you've done and don't want the blood anywhere and want it off you, which, this indicates impulse. I mean, wouldn't there be a better plan if you're hunting? You don't just go out unprepared to get away with it. There was nothing pre-planned for this. There was a stuff in the car that, that was discussed. Oh, one more thing, the keys. And it, that had hair in it. Um, just another thing that left behind. Now, car. Yes, we have binoculars, but she leaves her binoculars there for the police to find. On the open seat, she leaves the, a garden, uh, we call it a garden shovel or, or some potting shovel uh, there. I mean, that's there. You've got the rubber gloves there. And you knew you were wearing rubber gloves, you leave the exact same rubber gloves in the car. And also, why are there more than you know, the pair she had on? They're unused, apparently. They don't appear to have any stains on them been a box in the car at some point from her employment, something that she kept with her. And this COVID explanation, I mean, things have changed since then. We don't really worry about touch now with, with COVID. I mean, the CDC has said different things about it. It's not such a concern. But back then, this was the early days of it when we're necessarily sure what the most effective transmission or percentage of transmission was coming from touch versus you know air or droplets in the air and a lot of people were wearing gloves fast food restaurants are still wearing gloves they probably should always should but they didn't do that before they're still doing it and you had it on. I mean, it was very early. Some people, even if over time, people become less concerned with COVID, you know, kind of, I think it's overblown or um, you know, it's been exaggerated or whatever your personal thoughts on it are. Back then, it was kind of still, everyone was like, all right, we'll wait and see. And so different people did different things. Having the gloves on, is not dispositive of any premeditation, intent to kill, uh, malice of forethought. And you see in the center console, the, the mask was described by Michelle. 
Um, she did have other types of protective items in the car. There's another glove in the center console. Uh, doesn't appear, at least from the photographs, to have staining on it. Now the glove. This item, I mean, it's just another thing that was left behind. Uh, if this was a plan, you know, a hunter on the prowl. Oh, I forgot the first photo, or the first photo I showed of the scene where it was light out. You may remember asking um, Julie Kuiper if it was lighter and darker and darker out of that. She said no. Hunting in the daylight, the broad daylight. I mean, if you're going to plan an attack, why wouldn't you wait for a time until there's darkness, until you have that advantage to um, you know, pounce, to attack, to exact your revenge, to satiate your jealousy, your bloodlust. Because this isn't a hunt. Julie Kuiper's own words that she brought up was Hulk. Use the word Hulk. Now, if that's based upon ideas of, of the, the Marvel Comics character, the Incredible Hulk, who is powered by anger and becomes that way from anger. That's not premeditation, that's not planning, that's not malice of forethought. That is rage. That is someone who, as Michelle said, snapped. And when I'm describing that phrase again, this isn't a mental health defense. We're not saying it was insanity, temporary insanity, diminished capacity, anything like that. But the wording of the charge of manslaughter, the instructions, marshalling instruction for it, involves some stuff where you need to consider the person's mental process. And if you're the Hulk calming down from having snapped, perhaps that's what it would look like, what Julie Kaper described and throwing down an object on the ground with force, I believe she described it. Force because Michelle perhaps was disgusted with what she had done, realized what she had done. Now I say realized what she was done, again, I'm not saying it was insanity, diminished responsibility, anything of that nature. But you come out of the state you're in the provocation state and realize this shouldn't have happened. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't have stabbed Tracy. I shouldn't have ever come here. What do I do now? What I do now is I gather what I can think of glasses, get in the car, drive home, get this blood off of me that I never should have had on me, but I'm not fully human. I'm not, I killed someone and I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have done it. And this is what I made clear. As Mr. Cross brought up, sympathy, mercy, and I don't want you to sympathize, Ms. Bo. I don't want you to give her mercy. She doesn't deserve it. She killed someone, seatbelted, 
into her in her truck with no weapon, killed her and left her for dead. Drove off. That is not asking for sympathy. When I ask you to consider why? Because the way the evidence has been presented by the state, and there, there's a timeline, then there's a gap between a lot of this conduct that they've talked about before. Michelle got treatment, got out. Only thing after that point are these calls or messages, Facebook messages, to Tracy Mondeva's ex, asking him if he can take her back. That's what's in there afterwards. What can I do to get her back with him so I can work things out with Nick? Now, instruction 31, State has proved all the following elements of voluntary manslaughter. Now, we're asking for you to find Michelle guilty of voluntary manslaughter. It's still the state's burden. So this is why I say it's a little weird. As a defense attorney, for me to be making the state's arguments for them as to a particular charge. We believe the evidence has shown, and the lack of other evidence, that this is the charge that most fits the facts. On or about May 2020, 18th day, Michelle intentionally stabbed Tracy Mondeva. Intentionally. Manslaughter takes into account that you're doing this on purpose. It doesn't matter that it be, um, there's nothing that says they can't think about it, that they can't know what they're doing, that they, it's an accident, certainly not. Now, intentionally, manslaughter takes that into account. Then two, that Tracy died as a result of being stabbed. That's not in dispute. And the stabbing was done solely by reason of sudden, violent, and irresistible passion resulting from serious provocation. The state cannot rule out that Michelle stabbed Tracy solely from the sudden and violent and irresistible passion resulting from the serious provocation. The state cannot rule out that Tracy's words heard some crazy said to Michelle. I'm not even saying that's wrong. I am not telling you that what Tracy said was wrong about Michelle, because here we are. But does that have to be about a murderer? Again, a manslaughterer, which sounds weird to say, I don't know what that kind of phrase for it is, I'm assuming that's it. You could say that about them too. Clearly, this wasn't justified. And that's why we're not asking for self-defense. We're not saying that Michelle uh, might have saw Tracy reaching for a knife in her purse, or that Michelle might have seen um, some black object uh, in the console she thought was the handle grip to a gun, and so she acted preemptively and stabbed him. You know, this isn't a self-defense case. The state cannot rule out Tracy's words, combined with hitting Michelle and the grappling that they engaged in, after that point, were a serious provocation. And then, 
So you can't rule out this conduct, Tracy's conduct. Again, I'm not even saying it's the wrong conduct. I'm not judging Tracy that she shouldn't have done what she did. But that Tracy's conduct would cause a reasonable person to have a sudden, violent, and irresistible passion. Now, sudden, violent, irresistible. And I've highlighted there a reasonable person because that is used again Instruction 32 of serious provocation. It's conduct causing a reasonable person to have a sudden, violent, irresistible passion. Again, our manslaughter law assumes a reasonable person can do things like this. Which sounds crazy when I say it, kind of. But that's manslaughter. It's because we acknowledge humans are imperfect. That this is not a behavior that's unknown to society. That this is not an issue where we don't care why you did it. If it wasn't self-defense, defense of others, or an accident, you're a murderer. No, that is not what the law says. It's not what the law has ever said in this country. Passion is not sudden, violent, and irresistible. If there's an interval of time which a reasonable person would, and I've highlighted there, under the circumstances. Under the circumstances. And so that is why we've discussed this accumulation of a few things in that period of time that lit the fuse. The fuse was lit when Michelle went to Vermeer and saw that kiss. You heard from her even today, yesterday when she testified, she started breaking up saying that, discussing that kiss. That lit the fuse. Now we're not saying that's the provocation. We're not saying that that alone would cause a reasonable person to do this. But it's under the circumstances that the hitting and the words caused this. And when I say caused this, again, I'm not judging what Tracy did. A lot of us probably would have said and done the same exact thing if Michelle came up to our vehicle or seat belted in, knowing the history, and you know, a lot of people would react that way. And we're not judging who should have done, you know, dip, you know, Tracy should have done differently. And I don't want you to think that, that I'm trying to say that. Now. Michelle knew, she said she knew, she was in trouble. Because she knew that she shouldn't have stabbed Tracy Monfort. Hurt her in the way she had hurt her. And that she had lost control. That she had snapped 
And she knew that they were after her. Because she knew she did it. This isn't like, oh, well, you know, if you know you didn't do anything, why, why don't you just talk to the police and tell them your side of the story? And she knew that she had killed, or at least seriously hurt, Tracy Monica. And so, yes, she went into a self-preservation mode. Wasn't always, wasn't forthright with the police. Now, that is not a reason to discount that this is manslaughter and not murder. Again, we've said, charge is just a charge till the state proves it beyond reasonable doubt. And they haven't done that. What they have proven is voluntary manslaughter. And also this idea in serious provocation, highlighted here, and you know, think about this phrase a lot with manslaughter. I did while I was working on this, that suppress the impulse to kill. That's more than just let it go. That's an active process, suppression. You're not just, ah, oh, just let it flow out of me. There we go. That requires action. It requires you to do something. Now, what I was thinking about is in, in movies, a lot of times we'll see um, you know, military scenes and that nature, and you know, all the soldiers are shooting, they're concentrating fire on one object or one thing or a position. And you often see their commander it's like scream at them to stop, to hold your fire. You know, and it may take a while and they have to talk down the line or if they have radios now, and you can do it that way, but to get them all to stop. Suppress the impulse to kill. Michelle, when does she have time to suppress? To suppress the impulse, more than just let it go. It's to push it down. And she's supposed to push down this impulse to kill with a woman who, yes, she has been interested in trying to figure things out about, is now with her husband, who she's still married to, gets hit, gets screamed at and called a name, in the truck that smells like smoke, cigarette smoke that reminds her of Nick, and how they gave up smoking to be able to afford the truck, and how this interloper is in there smoking in it. Does she have Nick smoking again in the truck? All that we gave up, you know, we used to smoke and gave it up. We used the extra money because cigarettes are expensive to buy this truck, make the payments. And here she is, probably smoking in here. And the smell, it involves all the senses. The passion from this provocation was incited by all the senses except taste. I mean, it smells kind of a taste, or it can be. I don't know if the, the cigarette smoke, you know, incites a, a flavor in, in your mouth if you present it to anyone who smoked a long time, but if you smell it, kind of get that, that feeling on the tongue. Perhaps you could say it's taste. She had touch. She had Tracy hitting her them grappling. She had sound or hearing. Being called a name, yelled at. 
she had the smell and the sight looking at Tracy seeing Tracy who she she knows who she is she's run into her before she doesn't like her I mean there's no who would who would all Michelle's senses are being violated at that moment when she pulls open that door probably to give Tracy a piece of her mind probably potentially to, to fight her if it came to that. She was gonna let her know. I I'm gonna I'm gonna give her what I want to say. And you know what? If she mouths off to me, we're gonna fight. Maybe that's what was in her mind. And the smell hits her, pulls open the door, Tracy hits her. The words hit her, and the sight of the joint truck, the marital asset truck, and Tracy, her rival, were provocations, I should say, under the circumstances. All that together became a provocation that would cause a reasonable person to kill, to have that sudden, violent, and irresistible passion. Now, this reasonable person, under the circumstances again, who had children with Nick, been married for 20 years, She'd relied upon him for support, security. She'd been abandoned while she's at work. Left her alone during this chaos of the early pandemic. Gets insulted. And struck by the person who had taken Nick away from her. That's right. She wanted her out of the way. Again, she wanted to see if Nick would come back to her. And this, if you want someone to come back to you, they're going to come back to you after You've been charged and convicted of you know, murder or manslaughter for gold. It's to get Nick back, which the state seemed to rely on, that she had this delusion, I mean, it probably was a delusion, that Nick would come back to her. Then why? Would you throw all that away by doing this, either manslaughter or murder, which would tend to indicate impulse. Impulse, which is a hallmark of crimes that are not premeditated, planned, they have malice of forethought. Now, those were the injuries she suffered, the scratch on the face, and discussed the, the DNA expert, uh, Petrocelli, about DNA under the fingernail was inconclusive, um, I believe for two individuals, perhaps some skin was underneath from that, perhaps not, it's a possibility. Now, Michelle described initially when she went to the truck, she didn't have the knife. And we don't have a photo to show exactly how the cars were positioned. We have some testimony, but didn't go into great detail exactly how they were positioned. But the car was alongside the truck. You know, 
can, I don't remember if someone said slightly at an angle or not, but it's within feet of the truck. This isn't, you know, it's parked spaces over or it's, you know, parked parallel or perpendicular to the, the truck so they can't back out that's, you know, at the end. There's no, it's not like that. So in feet. This fight starts. Everything I've just talked about in Michelle's mind and she powder keg exploded. I mean, the fuse had been lit. The, the powder keg exploded. The fuse had been lit previously at Vermeer from that kiss. Burning down. Not a chance to extinguish. But even if there was, at the point the fuse is burning down, that's not what we're concerned about. It's whether you could make what's happening in your mind make the fuse go back to where it was before any of it burned. And when it's lit, that's not the serious provocation. The serious provocation in the encounter at the truck, combined with the circumstances surrounding it. What had happened that day, their family history together, length of the relationship, the manner that Michelle was abandoned, the time in which she was abandoned, in, the circumstances that she's almost penniless, has six dollars, and no work, and that is where she, the, the glasses that she's looking through when she sees Tracy and then gets hit by her, called name, a name, screamed at and grappled with. And again, we don't need to blame Tracy for anything for this to be manslaughter. What Tracy did, entirely justifiable. Like I said, probably not wrong. But that doesn't mean that this is murder. Now, Instruction 9, it's alternative theories instruction. You don't all have to believe the same thing about what the serious provocation was. If you believe the stuff, some of the stuff earlier would apply as a serious provocation, but your neighbor doesn't believe just the hitting by itself was, and that's it, or whatever facts you dispute. As long as you both agree, you think that's a serious provocation, this instruction says that's okay. There's more than one road to the same end. And you can go down your own path. As long as you agree what it is, what the outcome of it is, law doesn't care how you get there. Now, this quote, I mentioned John Adams and the Boston Massacre. Man is frail and passionate. When her passions are touched, she will be thrown off her guard. And therefore the law makes allowances for this frailty considers her as in a fit of passion, not having the possession of her intellectual faculties, and therefore does not oblige him to measure out her blows with a yardstick or weigh them in a scale. Let her kill 
with a sword, gun, or hedge stake is not murder, but only manslaughter. And this is returning to what started at the beginning that this is a concept that has been around a long time that seems odd to accept that any reasonable person could act in such a manner, could cut someone like that in their hands as they're defending themselves and stab them in the heart without it being murder. Now, reasonable doubt, you can get, you have these instructions. The state always has the burden beyond a reasonable doubt. They have on each and every element, in this case, on each and every charge, lesser included, and murder in the first degree, they've alleged in your jury instructions. That is their burden. And the presumption of innocence I've discussed, we need to go over that in much greater detail, but again, it is your job to search for doubts. You are tasked with that because you're supposed to presume innocent and not guilty. So the process starts with a doubt. I doubt she's guilty. They haven't told me anything yet. That is where you begin. And that's your primary job. This innocence says, requires you to put aside all suspicion which might arise from the arrest, charge, or present situation of the defendant. The presumption of innocence remains with the defendant throughout the trial unless the evidence establishes guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And that doesn't matter whether you like Michelle, you don't like Michelle, you think she looks mean, she looks cold, she sounds crafty, or she sounds whatever negative adjectives you and, and might have in your head looking at her. Because how many of us in this room can raise our hands and say, I've been charged with murder in the first degree after admitting I killed someone? Her. That's the only person here that can say that. At least I hope. I didn't see any hands, but it's the only thing Michelle has unique from this room. She killed someone, and now the state is trying to say, yeah, we don't like this old-fashioned manslaughter stuff. It's murder. You can't just go around, you know, following someone and, and then just because they happen on that particular day to piss you off, you get to kill them and not get convicted of murder. It's wrong. That's manslaughter. That's why it exists. And I don't care if you don't like that it exists. Your job's to follow the law and not break your oaths. It doesn't matter to me if you like Michelle. It doesn't matter to me if you like me, Miss Ironman, Mr. Bull, any anyone from the state of Iowa, Mr. Prosser, Mr. Harmon, the, the judge, the deputy, the court. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. Your personal feelings are not in play here. You're judges of the facts. You're not you know, diviners of emotion. You're not 
supposed to judge someone based upon how they look, appear. Don't cry when you think they should cry. Cry when they, um, you know, at some time that you just thought was odd or interpreting beyond what's common sense into your own particular quirks, let's use that word, it's not, not proper, because common sense implies that, oh, come on, anyone can see that, or it's a, it's a commonly held understanding or belief. And so that's why I say this thing shouldn't matter, because you cannot let your personal quirks dictate the lens that you view Michelle's culpability in this case. It's not mercy, it's following the law. Is it mercy to look at a set of facts and you as jurors say, oh yeah, not, not murder, it's manslaughter. And it reminds me to bring up, when we say lesser offenses and, and they're listed, um, you shouldn't take any inference from that any of those charges necessarily are, as a state, described less severe. Is it, you've been instructed you're not responsible for punishment, and the order that these are listed in don't necessarily mean anything. The issue for you to consider is, what don't I have doubt about? What doesn't make me hesitate to act? Hesitate to act. That is more passive than suppressing the urge to kill. Hesitate to act. You pause. Bing. That's hesitation. Pausing is far more passive than suppressing. You don't have to suppress your urge to act on murder one. You just have to hesitate. What gives you hesitation? Reasonable doubt. You can see in line two there, fairly naturally arises from the evidence in the case or from the lack or failure of evidence. If there's simply just not the evidence there to show it, and that makes you hesitate because, gee, I need to know this, I think, before I can say X. It's hesitation. That's doubt. Now, Proof of such a convincing character that a reasonable person would not hesitate. And there's a reasonable person language. Why? Why do you have to be reasonable? Because this is a standard under the law where if we want fair administration of justice, the law has to assume we have reasonable people on our juries, that we have standards of living, punishment, expectations that are based on reason. And the reason, if you look at the facts of this case, there's simply a lack of evidence premeditation and malice of forethought. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Malice of forethought I'll discuss it now. So, instruction I don't have this in my slides. 
I'm just thinking as the state was talking about it. 20. It may be established by evidence of actual hatred or by proof of a deliberate or fixed intent to do injury. Now, fixed intent. If you look at the manslaughter instruction, which I'll go back here. Thirty-one. If an intentionally stabbed Tracy Mondebach, malice forethought, or by proof of a deliberate or fixed intent to do injury, if you intend to stab someone, isn't that an intent to do injury? Stabbing them is an injury. So if, just because you think there was malice there, that doesn't make this murder. That does not make this murder one or murder two. Because there can be malice and have it still be manslaughter. And this fixed intent, it may be established by evidence of actual hatred or by proof of deliberate or fixed intent to do injury. Again, the hatred, state doesn't have the evidence for hatred. Like I said, this is one thrust of the knife. Now, they can say maybe, maybe more than that. The medical examiner says, can't say that. Could be from one. But let's say it's two or three instead of one. Still not for hatred. Hatred is, is beyond any level of feelings towards a person. You can't feel more negatively about someone than hatred. And be happy you're killing someone you hated. Be happy about it. You'd be stabbing, just much more sadistic than what the state can portray here. Inherently, killing someone in any manner, even self-defense, I mean, you could say it's sadistic, you've taken another life, I mean, but it's justified because you protect your own. And hatred requires a level, a feeling of wanting to snuff out the life of someone. Wanting to give them pain, agony, torture, slashes, cutting, bleeding for your own enjoyment. That's a hatred killing. This is not hatred. This was the Hulk. This was rage. Provoked anger, passion. Sudden and violent, with no time to suppress the urge to kill. The knife is in with feet of the car or of the truck. Reaches in the window, grabs the knife, a matter of seconds, is back in. And, you know, maybe Michelle was over Tracy. I mean, probably had to get in the cab to get to her, to fight her, to tackle with the knife. So the angle, Tracy's leaning back and tries to block the knife. And that's the downward angle you see. But it's hard to tell because if you're leaning back, you can't even have an upward angle. If you're leaning forward, perhaps downward. It, there, there's a lot of what ifs about exactly what position everyone was in when what happened. Because Michelle's the only one that knows is Tracy is deceased. And Michelle was in a rage 
and killed Tracy. You don't remember every little detail. You remember starting to come out, realize what you've done. You're like dumping out her purse because you're enraged about the cigarette part of it still and realize, what am I doing? What have I done? And throwing down the knife, disgust and anger at yourself at that point. And after that, it's all self-preservation. I mean, you know, committed crime and you got to do something. You don't know what. Yes, I should have thought of my kids. Yes, I should have thought of my, you know, my house, my dogs. Yes, I should have thought of those things before I killed Tracy. It's because she didn't have a chance to think about those things. She ruined Tracy's life, clearly. She ruined Nick's life, clearly. She ruined her own life by being a slaughterer. Not a murder. And so, going back to in closing here, Ms. Eimerman discussed with you in more dire jury selection, brought up this idea of the, the Tylenol bottle. Was discussing that this Tylenol square in the 80s, pills that had been capsules laced with cyanide. How many pills have to be in a bottle before it's unreasonable for you to be fine with you or your family taking one of those pills? I think we stopped at 10,000, didn't go beyond that, but. Reasonable doubt doesn't have to be a huge thing. It seems to be an important thing. And potentially you know, dying by taking a pill, that's a, a risk where who knows how many pills you want for you to consider, especially if you're asking a family member and not doing it yourself because then that's someone else's life. Now, another large number of pills in this bottle that you don't hesitate to act in taking any for yourself. Where you say, yeah, the state, there's a few things, but I'm okay with it. They've shown me that, eh, she's probably, she probably murdered her, but I'm fine with it. It's not a big enough risk, I'm really concerned about it. That's not beyond a reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt, beyond hesitating to act, evidence is such a convincing character that you don't have that hesitation. That you just open up the bottle and pop one down and hello, you know, we'll see what happens. That is not beyond a reasonable doubt. What the evidence has shown and the burden the state has met. You're going to see on the judge gives it to you, or you have it actually, the, the form of verdict number five. 
which we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of voluntary manslaughter. And so that is what we're asking. We've considered all the evidence, or heard all the evidence, you'll deliberate on it. Deliberation. Chance to suppress your reasonable doubts. A chance to suppress your hesitations. Or to reveal them. And so when you go back, deliberate actually stay here and deliberate, we ask you to follow the law, discuss it with each other, and not judge based upon a normal, everyday person, but a reasonable person. In this circumstance, the law allows manslaughter and that's what we have here in this case, ladies and gentlemen. So that is the verdict we would request. Thank you.